everyone. We are on chapter 8 and we are on paragraph 2. The supposition, however, does not meet the case. We relate percepts to ourselves, not mere, merely ideally through concepts, but also, as we have already seen, through feeling. Therefore, we are not beings with a merely conceptual content to our life. In fact, the naive realist holds that the personality lives more genuinely in the life of feeling than in the purely ideal element of knowledge. From his point of view, he is quite right when he describes the manner in this case. To begin with, feeling is exactly the same on the subjective side as the percept is on the objective side. From the basic principle of naive realism that everything that can be perceived is real, it follows that feeling must be the guarantee of the reality of one's own personality. Monism, however, as here understood, must grant the same addition to feeling that it considers necessary for percepts if these are to stand before us as full reality. Thus, for monism, feeling is an incomplete reality, which, in the form in which it first appears to us, does not yet contain its second factor, the concept or idea. This is why, in actual life, feelings, like percepts, appear prior to knowledge. At first, we have merely a feeling of existence, and it is only in the course of our gradual development that we attain to the point at which the concept of self emerges from within the dim feeling of our own existence. However, what for us appears only later, it is the first, it is, is, however, what for us appears only later is from the first indissolubly bound up with our feeling. This is why the naive man comes to believe that in feeling he is presented with existence directly in knowledge only indirectly the cultivation of the life of feeling therefore appears to him more important than anything else he will only believe that he has grasped the pattern of the universe when he has received it into his feeling he attempts to make feeling rather than knowing the instrument of knowledge since a feeling is something entirely an individual, something equivalent to a percept, the philosopher of feeling is making a universal principle out of something that has significance only within his own personality. He attempts to permeate the whole world with his own self. But the monist, in the sense we have described, strives to grasp through concepts, the philosopher of feeling tries to attain through feelings, and he regards this kind of connection with the objects as the more direct. And paragraph 2 is summarized as follows. We also relate percepts to ourselves through feeling, and not just ideally. The naive realist makes feeling his instrument of knowledge, whereas monism sees feeling as an incomplete reality, because feeling only has importance to an individual rather than being a universal principle. Um, in this paragraph, Steiner um, wants us to realize that in life, you know, we're not just thinking beings. So he now begins to point out, if anyone here is familiar with Steiner's concept, he always talks about the human being as a thinking, feeling, and willing being. And so now he's coming, he's pointed out that we're thinking beings, and now he's pointing out that we're feeling beings. Um, and for naive realists, they believe, well, this is a good um, thing that we can try and base our like feeling we can use it as an instrument of knowledge and um but for monism for what steiner's point of view is point is um believes is that feeling is a percept like any other percept um and that is not sound enough to base our reality on because um a feeling can be made into an object of observation and then you permeate that with the concept. So if I feel angry, it's not until I have that concept, you know, that that then I get it as a form of knowledge. I mean, I can feel that I'm angry, but that doesn't bring it to that next level where it's permeated with the idea, the recognition that I'm angry. Now I get the concept. Um, that I'm angry and then I can articulate that so he is putting feelings 
Steiner's putting feelings at the same level of a percept. It's an object of observation, and it is not something that we should use as um, an instrument of knowledge. And a good point he points out here um, is that, you know, it, it, it does, he does try to point out that for these naive realists, yeah, I mean, we can see where they're coming from to make that as a, an instrument of knowledge. I mean, they're not completely, you know, out of whack with, you know, this possibility. But yeah, you know, if I'm in this earth, you know, I get a feeling that, you know, yeah, I, I think I, ex I feel like I exist. That, that means that's got to count for something. So he's pointing out that that is something that is to be acknowledged. But it's not until the thinking kicks in about the feelings that you get that that's where the knowledge starts happening. And that's what he's pointing out in this paragraph. I'm going to move on to the next paragraph, which is paragraph three. The tendency just described, the philosophy of feeling, is often called mysticism. The error in a mystical outlook based upon mere feeling is that it wants to experience directly where, what it ought to gain through knowledge, that it wants to raise to feelings, which is individual, into a universal principle. And three is summarized as follows. The philosophy of freedom is called, excuse me, the philosophy of feeling is called mysticism, and its error is that it raises feeling, which is individual, into a universal principle. So I think basically that paragraph sums up what he just was talking about in paragraph two. Um, philosophy of feeling is mysticism and is trying to make feelings, this world of feelings, into something that's universal. And it's not. What makes feelings universal is adding the concept to the feeling and then that thinking and the concept, that is what is universal. And so that is how feelings gain universality, is when you add the concept. He doesn't say that in this paragraph, but, I mean, that's obviously what he's been saying all along, is just that thinking, adding concepts, that is what makes us have knowledge. Um, and so that's what he's saying in this paragraph. Um, I'm going to move on to paragraph four. Feeling is a purely individual affair. It is the relation of the external world to ourself as subject. Insofar as this relation finds expression in a merely subjective experience. And four is summarized as follows. Feeling is an individual experience as it relates the external world to ourself as subject. So again, feeling is not universal. Um, it's it's all about how you it's very individual um, not everyone's going to feel the same um, about when they see objects or whatever so um, but this is how it gives expression and meaning and, and having a life of feeling is adds to our existence and that's just what he's pointing out that it's not that it gives us this sense of of individuality otherwise we would just be like cold automatons if all we ever had was the life of thinking he doesn't come out and say that directly in this paragraph but that's sort of what he basically does eventually talk about is just that it feeling is individual and and it just makes us have that subjective experience and just adds to our life so that's all i'm going to cover for today so if there's any questions, just send me a message. Have a good day.